Hey class, welcome back. Uh, today's video is going to be the top five things you need to know about glazing. Uh, the best glazing tips and techniques that I've got and I've used over the things that I've learned over the years. As always, make sure that you like, subscribe, and leave a comment down below. I always want to hear from my classmates and see what you guys think. Welcome back class to a wonderful, exciting world of clay. Alright, so what are we up to now? Well, we're up to the second stage. So, first stage, you got your pieces, they've gone into the kiln and they fired the first time around so you'll come out with the bisque wear uh, so that, remember the bisque is the first firing takes out all the physical water out of the piece uh, to where you're at the second stage where you can start glazing the pieces and you don't have to worry about too, uh, the wet glaze going on to a uh, bone dry piece cracking all the nasty bits like that uh, I'm gonna set this off to the side now on the next stage you can you're going to paint and when I say paint, I'm using that as a really loose definition, uh, your design work onto your clay pieces themselves. So I'm working on a halo cup right here, got Master Chief. Um, and what I'm doing is I'm applying different colors of glaze to the exterior of the piece to go in for the next firing. So this second firing, uh, the bisque firing takes out all the chemical and physical water out of the clay so that I can add water to it. I could dump this whole glass of water on top of this piece. It's not going to do anything because all the water's already been baked out of it. So it's going to be perfectly fine. Uh, but the second firing that we're going to do is taken to full vitrification. Vitrification is where the clay has ta been taken to the most mature state that it's supposed to go to. All right, this is a low fire clay. It goes up to 0406. So it is fully vitrified at cone 04, whereas the butter clay, the high-end clay, the high-fire clay, that has to go to at least a cone 6. It can go up to a cone 10, uh, which is uh, about 2,500 degrees, but my kiln doesn't go that high. It only goes to 6. I know. Uh, so that clay is getting fully vitrified. Now, I'll take you guys in the kiln room and I can show you the kiln. All right, so for the glaze pieces themselves, uh, Get yourself a paintbrush because you're going to need one of these. Uh, make sure that you're using the correct paint brushes. You're not using the paint classes paint brushes, but you're using the clay class paint brushes. Uh, the main reason is because we're dealing with a lot of chemicals. I don't want to overlap chemicals in, in a couple different classes because it will destroy the brushes faster. Uh, for one thing, if you're mixing all those chemicals, it starts to eat away at the brushes themselves. Uh, but two, I just want to make sure that the glaze doesn't get into paint and then paint doesn't get into glaze. That's kind of the big reason uh, because you never know what chemicals are in the paint that are going to mess up your glaze. So right here I've got a nice black, but if I took a bunch of yellow paint and put it in here, the color wouldn't be so hot, but then the cadmium or the, um, the chromium oxides that are used to make that color are changing the chemical composition inside this glaze. That's kind of why I don't want to mix and match them. That's the big reason. All right, so take my brush. I'm going to use a different color. Uh, I'm going to rinse that brush out in my glass. So that's why I've got the glasses right next to me. Got some water. Now, here's the thing about water with clay. I don't want to pour this down the sink because it's got all this uh, silica and alumina water, which uh, all that stuff is used to make clay. Now because I've got all these chemicals floating in here, I don't want to dump those down the sink for a couple reasons. Number one, I don't want to pollute the water table. This is going straight back into the water table as it goes down the sink, gets into the water supply, it's got all these chemicals. It's a lot harder for the county to take out of the water, so it's a safety thing for one. Two, we can't make the fun mystery glaze, uh, which is why I got a bucket for them over here, and I'll try and move it delicately so you guys can see. We take all of our clay water and dump it in here that we've used for glazes, so as the water settles and separates, all those chemicals go to the bottom, get a little bit of hydro on the top, take the water off the top, got the chemicals at the bottom, mix them up, and paint your piece, and it's that cool, funky tie-dye color. Uh, we don't know what color it's going to be because we're mixing a little bit of red, a little bit of blue, a little bit of yellow. Is it going to make all those colors together? No, because they're chemicals, so it's going to make something we don't know what it's going to do. So each day it's slightly different. Try and use that to your advantage because it just makes a more interesting kind of piece. All right, so couple things you need to know about glaze. All right, number one, if it says L-U-G or has a G in there or it says the word gloss on it, it's going to be nice and shiny. If it doesn't say gloss, go ahead and anticipate it's going to be a matte finish, which is a dull sheen, flat, 
There is no life. There's no uh, that sparkly finish on the outside of it. Next thing we have over here is these little bottles. These little bottles are underglazed. And the underglaze is so that you can do a lot of detail, experimental drawing. You can kind of paint little pictures on there with this stuff. Uh, right here I have a terracotta color. So it's going to come out that orangey reddish uh, tone, which looks really cool if you're doing like a Greek influence piece. And what you'll do is you'll paint this on the cup right here. Let's say I want to put some stuff on the side of it like so. And then I'll take a gloss uh, transparent glaze or clear glaze and put it over the top. So that way I have a top coat over it to make sure that that design work that I did underneath stays, doesn't move. Uh, and then the top coat, the transparent glaze that's on top of it also works as not only a protectant and a seal, but it can be that shine or another, or again, it could be a matte finish. So everything looks flat or it could be nice and high shiny, uh, such as. They could be high shiny like our little minion people that we got over here. So you got this nice, uh, shiny exterior where it's that lemon glaze. It was a high, it was a gloss glaze, so it gives it that nice shiny look to it. Uh, and then a brown metallic for the uh, little goggle pieces that they're wearing just gives it that nice extra finish. All right, so one other thing to discuss is notice how there's a little bit of imperfection. Let's say it's imperfection, where around the eye socket here, it's flat. There's not a lot of detail to it. There wasn't a lot of glaze. Well, we know this is a low fire glaze piece. We can then add low fire glaze on top of it, refire it, and it'll just add another level to it. Now the big thing is not confusing the low fire with our high fire gear. Because if I put this stuff in at the same time and set it at a cone six, which is a high fire, this will melt completely to the kiln shelf, which is a big problem. Uh, and speaking of melting, let's talk about how we put glaze on. When we put glaze on, you can take it down to the foot or the rim down here. Try and give yourself a little bit of space just in case because if it's too thick and that glaze starts to doesn't go past the foot of the piece because if it weld if it comes down the foot I will have to smash your piece off of my kiln shelf. So the kiln shelf has some kiln wash on it to protect the shelf but if the glaze is too thick it'll melt and as it melts it'll start to fall down and attach itself to the shelf to which then I have to smash your piece off and chisel off any of the excess glaze that's attached itself to the kiln to, to the kiln itself. So make sure that all of the bottoms of the pieces are nice and clean. There's no glaze on them. So what I always do just as a precautionary thing, make sure you glaze up around the rim, take a, take a sponge, wipe it clean, and then wipe a little bit around it as well. You won't necessarily see it, but it'll ensure that the piece doesn't get smashed uh, and get stuck to the kiln shelf. All right, so the next thing we gotta talk about is some slip trails. All right, so uh, slip trailing is where you have, I like my little squeezy bottle. Uh, it's just a little nose sucker thingy for infants. Uh, and what I'll do is I'll just take some glaze, pour the glaze into it, has a little stop, uh, just hold your finger over it while you're pouring it in. And I can use it to trail a design onto a, onto a plate or onto a tile to create a interesting bit of work. And slip trailing as a design technique is just another thing that you can do. Instead of just taking a paintbrush, dip it in, paint with it, makes a little more interesting thing. All right, so I'm gonna take you guys back to the kiln, take a look at it, go over a couple things on it, uh, and hopefully you don't have any questions. If so, make sure you put comments in the below section. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe to the, to the, uh, to the show and also to the channel. Uh, just helps out the channel, helps out me, helps out do some cool stuff. Thanks. Hi. All right, class, so the other couple things we do need to touch base on real quick is when you're working on pieces, you have two different types of pieces that you're gonna be working on. Either it will be a hand-built piece, which is like a little money doll right here that we got going on. Uh, lots of crazy hair, slab technique, pinch technique, coil technique, all those things fall under hand building. The other thing is a wheel thrown piece, and the, this you build with your hands. This you have to build on the wheel. So that's the big difference between those two. Okay, and one other technique t that we do need to discuss that we haven't had a chance to yet is burnishing. Uh, here I have a simple spoon and a leather hard piece, or supposed to be leather hard, this one's bone dry. Now, what you're going to be doing for a burnishing piece is you take your piece, you take a spoon, and you start working it in small little circles. You burnish 
those sections together. What I'm doing is I'm making all the plates of clay that are in there still start to lay flat and stack and compress upon each other. This is going to give me a slot smoother finish and it's going to make a smoother texture uh, that I don't necessarily have to glaze. Uh, one of the burnishing techniques are you'll do several burnishing passes and then put it in the kiln and when it comes out of the kiln it's already finished. You don't have to glaze it at all. Um, I'm kind of 50-50 on it personally because glaze has its place and it, there's a lot of benefits to doing glaze and there's a lot of benefits to doing a burnish piece too. The clay body that these come out as and that nice white pristine look might be the look that you're going for so if you want to keep this and not really have to do a secondary step, burnishing might be the way to go. Me personally I look at this as blank canvas and I want to decorate it and do a whole bunch of fun stuff to it so burnishing, eh, not my thing personally but if that's something you want to take on. By all means, go for it, class. Hey, class, I hope that you liked that last video. Please don't forget to like and subscribe down there at the bottom. Now, I'm going to get back to uh, doing my thing, which is uh, work on my own stuff. So uh, don't forget to follow me on the web. I got a bunch of places you can find me, such as Pinterest. Or no, not, not, we're not doing Tumblr. Uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, uh, Group Me. That's a new one for me. And Steam. Uh, and my personal favorite, YouTube. Check me out, like and subscribe. See you guys later, next class. Follow, see you later, next class. Do your homework.